Uh, welcome to the Credit <clears throat> Connection. I uh, have with me today James Green of Origami Risk. Welcome. Hi, Sarah. Thank you. It's been a while. Yes, yes, it has. And of course, I think that's intentional because you're in Florida and you're warm and I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know, it was 75 yesterday, so it was very nice and sunny. Absolutely. Yeah, so. we had like 40. So yeah, you're you're on my list, but you are an expert <laughs> in business continuity planning and disaster recovery. And of course, uh, being in Florida, that's a good thing to be anyway. You guys have a ton of hurricanes and stuff, but um, today we're here to talk about the Texas storms and what happened with credit unions down there. And uh, hopefully we get some, you know, uh, best practices and solutions that I know uh, James can provide uh, in his how many years of expertise in this area? Uh, over 10. Over 10. So, That's because you're a baby, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I started doing this as a teenager. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, we all know, and now Ukrainian Times has reported that Pfizer have had some pretty significant failures uh, that affected credit unions around the country, not just in Texas, um, right. as a result of the historic term, uh, storms in Texas. Uh, talk a little bit about what surprised you about that situation and what can we do to avoid something like that in the future? Uh, what could Pfizer do? We'll start there. <clears throat> Yeah, so I guess let's talk about what didn't surprise me, maybe first. So, you know, there were storms uh, in, in, in Texas in 2011. I've got some stats off to the side, so I make sure I get these right. But in 2011, 241 power plants had problems with cold weather. And so in 2021, 30 of those same plants had the exact same problem. Right. And over 340 plants had those problems in general. And what's not surprising about that is most organizations tend to try to mitigate the last known risk. Right. So like you said, I'm in Florida. Uh, we have very good hurricane plans. I guarantee every company in the world for the next 18 months will have the most beautiful pandemic response mm -hmm. plans. And it, kind of what I saw in doing some research on, on Texas is everyone used the 2011 storms as a baseline. And we said, we're never going to let that happen again. And there were two problems with that. The first was no one ever thought, what if there was something worse than that, right? They just took 2011 as the absolute worst. And then the second thing is a lot of the, the guidelines and standards that came up uh, by the state of Texas were recommendations. And I guarantee what's going to happen now, because unfortunately we've had loss of life this time around, those won't be recommendations, those will be requirements. But it was kind of disheartening to me that uh, the different power companies I saw, not one of them said, well, what if we have something worse than 2011? Let's just mitigate that risk right? Let's mitigate this one specific standing water line, water pressure risk, and not look at anything worse. So that's uh, unfortunately very common. Like I said, most people tend to, to mitigate the last known risk. So that's not surprising. Uh, what is surprising to me, and you and I can talk about this because other sources have reported it, were some massive gaps that I feel Fiserv had in their business continuity and disaster recovery programs. So they have a very large server farm in uh, Irving, Texas, Irvine. I'm a, I say it wrong every time. I've been to a lot of server farms there. So, you know, the first thing they had, they're like, okay, we have backup generators if we lose power, which is great. And it sounds like the backup generators worked as intended, but here's where the surprise come in backup generators run on fuel. They're not just this magically sourced thing. Uh, and the Credit Union Times is reporting that those generators ran out of fuel. So that's very surprising to me. How do you not know how long your generators run? And more importantly, a lot of mistakes companies make, you may have a generator that lasts 12 hours, 24 hours. How are you gonna refuel that generator. I would think a company of five serves size 
most enterprise companies that I've worked with around the world, that if they have generators, they have dedicated fuel to run those generators. So the first surprise is they ran out of fuel uh, and that's problematic. And then the second surprise, it sounds like they had problems failing over their servers from their uh, Dallas operations to their Georgia operation. So their plan was to drive servers in trucks over several states, which is a to me, there's concerns there around privacy, security. Uh, and that's a really bad disaster recovery plan. Like, hey, Sarah and I are just going to throw some servers in our car and drive to the other office and install them. That's, you know, if I was a credit union where that was my core, I would be really concerned about that was where our disaster recovery plan ended up. Yeah, and those are some of the most basic things, fuel. Like, and, and as far as <clears throat> tech and IT is concerned, having a failover that functions. Um, so what are some of the steps that credit unions themselves could take in the future to mitigate a situation like this? <clears throat> Yeah, so certainly I think there's short term and long term steps that I see get missed all the time. And the first short term miss is that when your core has a failure, are you communicating with your members proactively? Because the problem is I'm a credit union member, you're a credit union member. If I swipe my card, and we saw, you know, with Fiserv, uh, I guess on February 26, again, since I'm in the South, all of Chick-fil-A went down for Fiserv. And if I swipe my card and it gets declined or goes, you know, error or whatever, as a member, I'm not thinking, oh, I can't believe Visa. I can't believe Fiserv. I can't believe First Data. I'm thinking, no, my credit union is not letting me access my money. And the fastest way to lose members is they can't access their money. So I would love to see more credit unions proactively tell members, hey, we're having an issue upstream. We're having an issue with our vendor, whomever. We will get you access to your money as soon as possible because I'd rather get that text than when I'm standing in line trying to swipe a card and be embarrassed. So, you know, the biggest thing, you and I have talked about this for years, one of my biggest you know, pound the table moments about a crisis is be proactive with your communications. I think uh, what credit unions can do long term, they should be aware of the risk that their critical vendors have. It's certainly not practical to have two cores. You can't run a credit union like that. So if one fails, you switch over to the other. I'm not saying that that's not practical. But I'm surprised in talking to credit unions the last few weeks, how many of them had no idea the risk that their cores have. So you should have it in your contract that you have a right to see their disaster recovery plans, their business continuity plans, their test results. And if you're a big enough credit union that you sit in on those disaster recovery tests. If you are a billion, you know, huge credit union, you can ask for that when you negotiate or re-up. And those are really important because you wanna see, you know, what's the likelihood of my core going down? And certainly if you knew they only had eight hours of fuel or 12 hours of fuel, or they can't fail over, you know, hey, I have a bigger risk here than I thought I did. And that's, you know, sometimes mitigating risk with a vendor is just really quantifying what is the risk and what is that core or that key vendor doing to mitigate, you know, the risk. And I think a lot of companies and especially financial institutions miss on that. And I think there will be some things coming out from, you know, the federal government after after Superstorm Standy, you had uh, Jack Henry, you had some other companies that had failures in their New York data centers. And the federal government was very clear, you can outsource a process, but as critical financial infrastructure, you cannot outsource the risk. So if your core goes down and it causes you to go down, the government is not going to delineate 
uh, between that. And I think we're going to see more of that coming out of, you know, what happened in, in February. Yeah, one of the things that I think we were, you were talking about surprises earlier, <clears throat> a credit union executive, you know, whether it's a CEO, CIO, whoever is responsible primarily, <clears throat> I guess in the end, the CEO and the board, but um, that they don't ask about be, uh, business continuity plans or disaster recovery plans? What is, is there an educational issue going on there? What, it, what is that? That just seems so obvious to me. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we heard a term during the, the 2008 financial crisis of too big to fail. And I think a lot of credit union boards and executives just think, well, I can never leave my core Anyways, like we see, you know, in the industry, we see credit unions changing cores. That is a huge, expensive, messy proposition. It's technically possible, but it's problematic. And so I think a lot of companies just think, well, I can't control what they do anyways. So I'm just not going to force that issue. But I think it is on the board and it is on executives to know, hey, what is the likelihood that, um, you know, we go down because of another company? That is a, a key component of risk management, assessing, you know, the business continuity resilience, not only of your credit union, but of your, of your vendors and your partners. And I think this will be another wake up call for, again, we saw this. I want to say 2014 or 2015 first data had an issue where they went down on Black Friday. So there was a huge swath of their customers. Black Friday couldn't shop at all. And that spurred a lot of credit unions to start, you know, poking around with this core. And I would expect what's going on with Fiserv and especially now that they've merged with first data, I think this will spur another round of of questions and hopefully awareness that there's no company in the world that's bulletproof there's gonna be issues and how are you prepared to respond to them and what's your plan and you know the the Pfizer one again i think is really interesting sometimes you have to make decisions in the moment so Pfizer was chick-fil-a's you know uh credit card servicing provider they went down, they made a decision immediately. They were just, you know, comping meals or um, giving away coupons. They made a decision at a corporate level within an hour. Mm -hmm. And that is sometimes you can't prepare for every single thing, but what you can do as a credit union, as that executive team, something happens, how long does it take you to make a decision based on input coming in? Yeah, I read that as well about the Chick-fil-A uh, giving out meals because people couldn't run their cards. And, you know, you also mentioned the first data situation on Black Friday, which is bad enough. But, you know, especially in the Texas situation, you had people without water, without yeah. electricity. And the people who were most vulnerable, the people who could least afford to do anything about any of it, didn't even have access to the money that they have. Um, so, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Cause I know we've talked a lot about, you know, social responsibility of credit. Union yeah. In well, situations. I think the first thing that's going to happen is like I said, if I couldn't buy something on black Friday, you couldn't get your 60 inch TV. Oh, well, I couldn't get my chicken sandwich on a Tuesday. Oh, well, what happened in Texas where there was loss of life because of power. Like you said, you have people suffering during month 16 of a pandemic, can't get access to cash. So the first thing that always happens, I find after loss of life is the government gets involved, unfortunately, right? Or maybe fortunately, depending on which side of that coin you look at. But the first thing that happens is there's gonna be new regulatory requirements. That's kind of the bare minimum. But to your point, you know, we're in the credit union industry because of our ties to the community. What are our responsibilities to the community? And I think, 
you know, this is going to be another wake up call for credit unions to say, in some of our members most critical time of need, right, we let them down. And it wasn't because of buying a TV or a sandwich, it was the, the power's out, I can't get access to water, you know, were we, how did we contribute to that? And what are we going to do to mitigate those risks? And you saw a lot of credit unions are, are very positive in response after, again, hurricanes, where there's widespread regional power outages. You see some credit unions pop up temporary branches or do all of these really extraordinary things in a short amount of time um, to help their members. And I think as what happened in Texas and as we continue to have climate change and weather you know, volatility, I think you're going to need to see credit unions outside of those typical zones of Florida, Alabama, miss, you know, places that get hit by storms start to think about Okay, what if we have a winter storm in Texas? What if we have snowfall in DC? How are we going to be more prepared to, to help our members in worst case scenarios? Because we're seeing those worst case scenarios. Look at a lot of a lot of credit unions. I know their branches are still closed 12 months later because of of a pandemic or it's drive through only or they're going to virtual tellers or look at all that's happened now and i think that's another thing you know that we expect boards to do um back in the glory days of 2018 2019 when the world was nice and quiet if a company even thought about a business continuity event they were thinking about one at a time mm -hmm. right and now what we've seen over the last two years you had a pandemic and then you also got hit by ransomware. You had a pandemic and you also got hit by a winter storm. So financial institutions are gonna to need to become more resilient to be able to handle not just one thing at a time, but now two or three. And we've seen that play out a lot over the last year and a half where it's pandemic plus civil unrest, plus power outage, plus ransomware, plus malware, plus whatever you want do you have the capacity now to juggle multiple incidents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, <clears throat> and we're we're seeing it come more fast and furious, just a lot because the pandemic has lasted so long. And you know there are credit unions in so <laughs> there are credit unions in California, and I'm sure New York and other cities where you know they just don't have the real estate to have drive-throughs. And so how many were not prepared from a digital and mobile perspective uh, to serve members and especially serve members as long as it's been um, in a way that the members hoped and expected to be served. Um, yeah, and certainly I think that that definition of service has changed. Like for a lot of credit unions, maybe they weren't cutting edge digitally Right. But to your point, when I went into the branch, it was the highest level of service of any financial institution. So if I go into a massive bank versus I go into a credit union, the level of service, there's no comparison. But you take all of that away and now I'm only online or I'm only calling in. And I've seen a lot of credit unions have been struggling with their call centers mm -hmm. where because everyone's calling now, <clears throat> the average wait time is way too high. You are degrading the member experience, your service to members, and people are going to change financial institutions or providers. Mm. Like it's just, you know, they have to be, we have to be prepared for the market changing. And this pandemic wasn't two or three weeks, it was a year and a half. And I think you'll have some people never go back to an in branch experience just like we're we're expecting to see trends and some people will change their travel habits permanently or their restaurant or shopping permanently i would expect a lot of people are going to change their 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 banking habits permanently and our credit unions like you said if you don't have the real estate for drive through and no one ever comes back into the branch you have a huge expense now for a big empty space mm -hmm. And what are you doing with it? 
Yeah, and that's its own disaster recovery right there. Um, the so getting back to uh, one of my favorite topics, communications, <laughs> being more yeah. proactive in it. What are some of the things that Koreans should do at different stages in their communication when they realize something like this is happening? Like their their core is down and it's down for four days. You know, how what what do they do in those situations? So in the in the first part of an incident you know, I always work with people just put a communication out because you want to be controlling the message. Again, if I get a text from my credit union before I'm trying to use a card or call or whatever, you, 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 you show that you're, um, it's, it's, it's more honest, right? A lot of credit unions or any type of organization don't start talking about an incident until it's on social media, until it's in traditional media. They immediately come out responding. It feels defensive, right? So the first thing is get that message out there. And then the second thing is, as something like you said, goes two, three, four days, you have to have consistent messaging. You can't just send an email or put something up on your website that says March 1st, 9 a.m. And now it's March 8th. Like you can't, that's almost as bad as doing nothing. You need to have, um, depending on the severity of the incident, you need to come up with a cadence. Is it hourly, two hours, four hours, daily, whatever, but just consistent because you let your audience know and feel that you're working on the problem. It's but if I get a message from you, yeah, yeah. If I get a message from you seven days ago, yes, we know there's a problem. I'm going to keep calling in, right? And you also take that's a lot of thing by not communicating. You are generating the amount of inbound. So your your phone lines, your email, everything's just going to get overwhelmed. So you need to have an early message and you need to have a consistent message. Um, and, you know, you and I spoke about before we got on camera, some credit unions have been very comfortable in throwing their vendors or cores under the bus. And I think they do that to let their members know, like, hey, we are involved in this problem, but we are not the root cause mm -hmm. of this problem. And it's been very surprising, like you and I spoke about, to see some people call out their core by name and not an anonymous source or, you know, but CEOs, like very high level people who have, have been very upset and are, are happy to, to point out where some of the challenges are. It'll just be interesting to see if their members, you know, agree with that or don't care. Yeah. And I think most members, again, if I can't access my money, I don't care. Yeah. So. Yeah, it even affected my credit union all the way up here in Maryland. So it was, it was yeah. a big situation. <laughs> so any last words of wisdom for uh, financial institutions uh, and their vendors or their vendors um, about you know, how to handle the business continuity planning, um, strategizing in advance, and then you know, testing and playing out those scenarios? Yeah, I certainly think as a credit union, you need to know exactly how resilient your vendors and your cores are. And you need to put that language in your contracts because most companies, and it's not just specific to cores or financial institution, if a customer comes to them and wants all this stuff, they're going to say that's not in the contract. So the bare minimum, put that in the contract and when you have the most leverage is when you're renewing, right? Because then you are a flight risk to your vendor. And that is the best time to put language in there around, I want to see test. I want to see test results. I want to be involved in tests. I want to change the language for force majeure. A lot of companies, you know, act of God or force majeure is so broadly defined. It could be anything. You want to really make that language tight so that they can't opt out of anything. And ideally, you want to have financial penalties for a company 
that that goes down. We saw again, you know, that first data outage years ago, some credit unions, the penalty for losing a whole day of Black Friday transactions was a thousand dollars. Whoop de doo. You know, you want to have significant financial penalties, one to make you whole. Uh, but two, if you're trying to restore your business, you're going to prioritize based on where the financial pain points are. So that's that's certainly something um, credit unions should be doing, financial institutions should be doing. And then the quality of your disaster recovery testing and who has that information. So Fiserv backup generators running out of fuel. I'd be very curious to know did management know, senior management know that there was a limitation to the generators or how long they could run? Or were they just told, oh, we have generators, we're going to be fine. You know, management, you need to ask those more sophisticated questions and not just check the box. Because there's a big difference between we have generators that can run for five days or we have generators that can run for four hours. So that kind of sophisticated questions, um, I think really spur more meaningful failover test and you know truly identify where your risks are. Well, thank you very much, James, for your time today. Appreciate it. Again, James Green with Origami Risk. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. And cut.